This video is brought to you by my patrons. This is not Ghibli, but it's damn close. This is Legend of Hei, a Chinese animated feature wearing its influences on its sleeve, created by animator MTJJ. From small beginnings with a free web series to a massive feature, after four plus years of dedication, the movie is born. A successful one at that, grossing over $45 million in China alone. With the Japanese dub releasing today, we may see another spike. But does that stand against the biggest of Japan? He takes on a lush, vibrant background aesthetic with lots of strong greens and the fluffiest clouds as you'd expect from its forefathers, but now on a digital canvas, playing with uh, expectations, using imagery closer to the web series with flatter backgrounds and outlines, where the major movie uses a more impressionistic style. In comparison, there's no lines, in contrast to the simple character designs. Not as far off from the early days of Toei, albeit with thicker strokes, standing bold on those big landscapes. If it be the warm tropical or the stormy seas, it's easier to push these character designs that are pretty animation friendly to the max to create something more impressive of the animation. While the original was no slouch, I mean, come on. MTJJ's action is to find itself by blistering speed and flowing movement, almost like a paper dragon in the wind, with both the camera and figures moving in tandem, blink and you'll miss it, and to the chaos as the unique powers of each fighter, recalling a shonen showdown. <laughs> Accentuated in the movie with its use of 3Ds to spin and pull the background in different directions. The rhythm of the percussion and sound design keeps that momentum going until it slips into slow-mo. As big as those battles are, it is not against playing with audience expectations. Comedy plays a role in the picture, as it did in the show. Legend retains its chibi-esque gags from Luau Xiaohei if it be through characters wit or slapstick or breaking the fourth wall. Now the movie is a little less forward in some of those areas, but it still plays with the expectations in fun ways. Sometimes the comedy can feel stuck within the limits of its web show origins, which can lead to a dissonance when you put it against what is a pretty glossy and impressive animation set piece, all things considered. But the characters do sell it, so I mean, it's not that bad. <laughs> There's a large cast, but for the story, they really only focus on three, and most of them are Alfin. Now, Alphen are basically, in this world, sort of a wide berth of magical creatures, some deriving from myth, and they kind of run the gambit from forest spirit to deities, all which live in secret among the modern human world, which is in itself uh, a cause for the divide in the story here. There's a bait and switch at the beginning, because you see the people that save Hei, who is the main protagonist, from homelessness and worse, are not as altruistic as they first seem. So when Wu Shen appears, wiping out everyone, you assume this is going to be some sort of recovery mission film instead of a road trip. Oh, montages. This film loves its montages, by the way. The burgeoning relationship between Wao Shen and Hei is the core dynamic of the movie. Wao Shen is cool, elegant, and quiet in contrast to Hei's impulsive hot-headedness. Along the way, we're asked about morality and what makes someone good or bad. And can you tell at the first sight of it, especially when you are an individual with a massive amount of potential and influence? This is definitely something explored in the series constantly. There aren't actually villains within the show. It tends to be more so people with conflicting goals 
and others who are in desperate situations. This is an area where the movie isn't as successful, it takes a simpler approach. Well, Feng Ji has justifications for their actions, and I'm sure I, I can get behind some of it. It does go from 0 to 100 in pretty much an instant. He's basically an anarcho primitist wanting the world to return to a pre-industrial revolution, by any means possible, since humanity stole his home and continues to strip many lives of the elfin population. But his goals fall straight into terrorism very fast. He has no qualms with killing any innocents at all. So it's less nuanced than I would prefer, in the sake of upping up the spectacle, I suppose. It's hard to identify with them as much, especially when you consider there is an alternative here. The guild themselves are people trying to integrate elfins into the new world, while also giving them huge financial support. So in the end, it feels like it's more of a pride game than anything else, than a, a fight for survival. Many of these elfins make up the side cast, which are pretty much exclusive to the movie. You don't have to like understand any other text to get what's going on here. And there's definitely a couple of highlights within this character realms, even if they are mostly simplistic. Say for example, Niza making a cameo seemed fitting to me as he's an icon of Chinese culture and Chinese animation, especially now. I'm the master of my destiny! I'll be the one who decides! And I will not be a demon! Now that climax goes big, almost as big as uh, any other film you could see from Marvel. It's bombastic enough especially, we know it's got that city ending technique, the super team saving people, a climactic fight among titans before Hia finds his true potential. Its conflict is straight up visual splendor, simple and popcorn, but engaging nonetheless, even if it isn't what you'd expect perhaps from a Ghibli finale. But the studio is trying to define its own language along the way, while keeping up with others in the competitive markets. And surely in its defense, they do sort of reaffirm what their sort of identity towards the end while asking the philosophy of like these characters, are they actually in the wrong perhaps, or are they just misguided? The film definitely gives the impression that rehabilitation is a possibility, opposed to certain other types of films where it pretty much is just impaling an antagonist and then forgetting about them for the next movie. And it certainly does hit a stride towards the end, especially with its sense of new belonging in Hayes' relationship, coming from an unlikely place, which isn't the first time we've seen it in the series either. Most elfins seem to distrust and hate humans for legitimate reasons to some degree, and Hayes starts within a position similar to that, and he learns throughout that humans aren't exactly special. There are good ones, and there are ones that aren't so much. And that path of hate is not something that should drive him, and seeing the dark mirror reflection in front of him, it leads him onto the straight path, with a pretty wholesome ending to put it all together. Notwithstanding that there are some issues with the film, perhaps be it uh, unpolished CGI, it probably needs a couple more shaders, but not exactly the worst thing I've seen in terms of compositing. Maybe it's inconsistent scoring or, you know, some of the minor issues I have with the story overall. But considering the situation we're talking about, which is a first time film director working with a pretty much independent studio, this is basically a miracle. Yeah, what makes me appreciate it all the more is that original web series. From the early episodes where the cast is basically just a couple voice actors and the director's doing most of the animation himself, then seeing it slowly build into a team with sponsorships and merchandise, well, you don't have to watch the show to understand the movie, or vice versa, really. It can widen the scope of the world. Like, you get to understand what happens in elfin society, like how its hierarchy is, and exactly how the guild can even function. But past that, it's just like a great series to watch, and I think it surpasses the movie in a lot of ways. There may be less action, and it tends to take a more laid-back approach, but you get to some, spend some time with those characters in a way that, like, if it turns serious, you really do care. You can watch the story also evolve in terms of its modest opening to something that's quite grand towards the endings. As well as its ingenuity when it comes to its uh, own fight scenes, uh, it's actually a lot of fun to watch. And every episode's only about five minutes, which makes it for a pretty comfy experience. You also get to see a lot of the references and things that inspire the creators to begin with. Uh, uh, so, as well as just seeing how much that uh, directorial intent matures within those 28 episodes, really coming together with an episode at the end that ties together the movie to its first episode in 2011. I'm glad such an indie studio could have this much success, and I hope they take up the next step, not just to be inspired by people like Ghibli, but to become that kind of studio, one that can express themselves through their movies, or series, or whatever it is, to create their own true vision, you know? 
And I literally just watched their new show and oh my god, like as I'm writing this right now, it's like the best thing they've done, I swear. I, I, it need, they need a season two, but... Oh, damn. He could almost be a mascot for this whole project going forward. He's definitely cute enough. And if this source is correct, it looks like there's a sequel on the way. Like it or not, the world of Chinese animation is growing. In Han Fang Zhang's article, he states that the change in philosophy within the younger generation in China towards animation and video games as a core part of their life now makes them want to express themselves through those mediums. If that means more independent studios working on these kind of projects, then I definitely will look forward to it. We have experimented with dozens of various art forms in creating the film, and this is our art exploration in possibly every direction until we could find the current tone. So I'm hoping there'll be actually a proper full release in the West coming out at some point. I mean, I'm hearing that Shout Factory may, uh, may be the one doing it because they claimed this video like three times when I was editing it. So certainly they must have something to do with it and perhaps they'll start claiming it again. But realistically, I do want people to go out and buy it and support the thing. I would love to see a collection where you get the original series and the movie, you know, and uh, maybe, maybe that second movie if that's coming out. I'd love to see it all. I'd love to see it all somewhere. Now, usually this is the part where my cat would thank my patrons, but she's kind of asleep, like, over there somewhere. Somewhere over there. She's, she's like, curled up. She, she's quiet. But we are thinking in terms of patrons that there may be uh, some goals coming up, some goals including the cat camera, so I can always keep a first-person view of any time she buzzed into my video and ruins my recording. So that would be fun, among a bunch of other stuff. Also got to thank specifically Joven, that Puerto Rican guy, and Daniel Strait for the help. Along with everyone else, we should have plenty of videos coming in December because it is the month of Madhouse Madness. And, and a couple more in the next year. Things are going to keep rolling. Now, getting on to other stuff, there's a collab coming in the future, maybe in the next couple of days, maybe it's already out, I don't know, but it's going to be on Japanese music and I'm going to be on a different channel and I will be linking it here somewhere up here if it's already happened. So look forward to new and wondrous takes on stupid things in the future. Catch you then.